Where did he go? You bribed your way onto this group? I can't believe it. <laughs> oh, I bribed back. <laughs> Cast leaders have complained that this organization is like herding cats. I, I don't know where this control freak came from. But, uh, I think we're for a seriously bad year. Right? Not a bad year. I want to see the board revolt. I want to see the same crap get thrown at him. They got thrown at every other president before him. I don't want to see top hats and canes marching in time to his music. That's not fair. You got to treat him like you did the rest of them. This control stuff has to end. All right. Somehow we got to shift gears. You know, PE's over. <laughs> The Stephen Goldstein Award is named after FSU criminal law professor Stephen Goldstein. Steve taught criminal law full time to knuckleheads like me, and with the rest of his time, <clears throat> he fought injustice. His fight focused largely on the death penalty. He donated countless hours to the Volunteer Lawyers Resource Center and to the office of CCR. He personally handled cases and was always available for advice and assistance to other lawyers. He did his work quietly, effectively, and passionately. His passing left a void that we all still feel. This award is named in his honor, and it is awarded to men and women who do what Steve Goldstein did. Spend their lives passionately fighting injustice on a daily basis. Tonight, we have the great privilege of honoring a giant in our field. Albert Krieger has been a criminal defense attorney for longer than many of us have been alive. For more than 50 years, he has not just fought the good fight, he has set the standard by which we all are measured. His work in the courtroom is the stuff of legend. He has won more acquittals than most of us have had trials. His clientele have included mobsters with names like Bonanno and Gotti. He's been involved with drug dealers, named Magluto and Falcon. He's represented Port of Miami officials charged with corruption. And he's represented all manner of citizens in between, whether they were rightfully accused or wrongfully accused. No one does a better job for his clients in a courtroom than Albert Krieger, year in and year out, for decades. He has put the government to the test and more often than not, he has prevailed. But this award is not about who's the greatest trial lawyer, and that's not why he was nominated for it. Albert Krieger set the standard for defense lawyers in all aspects of our professional lives, not just in the courtroom. Albert Krieger has selflessly devoted his time and talents whenever and wherever needed. In 1973, the Lakota Sioux engaged in a series of protests against treatment they were receiving by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. The confrontations became violent and several people were killed, including, I believe, federal law enforcement agents. Albert Krieger went to Wounded Knee, South Dakota to defend American Indians after every lawyer in the state of South Dakota refused to be a part of that case. He left behind his family, he left behind his practice because he felt it was the right thing to do. He was embarrassed by the defense bar because no one else would step forward. And he did what he's done so often in his career. He led by example. And remember, this is in the days before cell phones, faxes, or personal computers and email. Going to South Dakota was like going to the moon. He said goodbye to his family and to his practice, and he did it pro bono. And while the rest of the bar stayed at home trying to figure out how to steal some of his clients, he was in South Dakota doing what he thought was the right thing, and doing it well. For six months, he battled the government in the most hostile environment you can imagine, and won an acquittal. If you haven't heard the details of that story, make him tell you sometime. I guarantee it will make you proud to be called a criminal defense attorney. But that's not why Albert Krieger is getting the support. Albert Krieger has always shared his considerable talents with young lawyers. He's been a wonderful teacher for many of us and made us far better lawyers than we would have otherwise been. Raise your hand, and I haven't done a poll, and I know it's dangerous for a lawyer to ask a question he doesn't know the answer to. 
But raise your hand if you've been to a seminar or a CLE function that featured Albert Krieger as a speaker. Just look around the room. And leave your hands up if you learned something valuable from Albert Krieger. And leave your hands up if you thought you'd shave your head if you could be like <laughs> I received an out-of-date copy of Albert's CV so I could prepare these remarks. There were over two full pages of lecture and teaching dates that ranged from Alaska to Puerto Rico, from Maine to California. He's lectured in England, Spain, and Holland. And He's been invited to little places like Harvard, but he's also taught at the nation's most prestigious academy for criminal defense lawyers, the National College of Criminal Defense. He's been on that faculty since it was founded in 1973. For those of you who are not familiar with it, the National College is the premier training ground for criminal defense lawyers. It's simply the best. And a large measure of its success is the quality of the faculty it attracts. Albert Krieger has donated his time and talent to the National College for more than 25 years. And over the years, it's been in such exotic locations as Houston, Texas, and now Macon, Georgia. Anybody that would go to either of those two cities <laughs> deserves an award. And he's done it for over 25 years. And he's done all of this at great cost to himself. I mean, the time commitment alone has been enormous. His efforts have been unflagging. If you look at the seminars he's attended, you'll notice a pattern. Many, if not most, are public defender events. He cares about justice. He wants to help make better lawyers. And he's done a magnificent job of teaching us all how to be better lawyers. And that's not the reason Howard Krieger is getting this award. Those of us who helped start FACDL take great pride in giving voice to the criminal defense bar here in the state of Florida. We're proud that we finally recognize the need for the, for the criminal attorneys to be involved in the public debate about criminal justice issues. We're proud of that and we should be. But Albert Krieger is way ahead of us. He helped start the NACDL more than 30 years ago. He was there in the beginning. He eventually served as president and he's never stopped serving. While with NACDL, he engaged the Justice Department in dialogue on such issues as fee forfeiture, the attorney-client privilege, and other issues that go to the very heart of what we do as criminal defense attorneys. The NACDL is fun. I mean, it's what we're doing tonight. It's criminal defense lawyers hanging out with criminal defense lawyers and having a good time. I'm, I'm certain he enjoys every moment of that service. But Albert Krieger has done much more. He represents the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers in the ABA House of Delegates. He's done that for many years. That is not so enjoyable. It is long, tedious work. He recently chaired the ABA Criminal Justice uh, Section. And again, it's an enormous undertaking requiring constant attention and travel. But because of the respect and the credibility that Albert Krieger has earned over the years, he was instrumental in the debate which forged the ABA position on such vital issues as a moratorium on the death penalty, the treatment of enemy combatants, and the right of habeas corpus for suspected terrorists. None of us could have done the job that he's done as well as he's done it in that arena. And so it is for all of those reasons that we nominated Albert Krieger, not just to honor him, but to thank him for his lifelong pursuit of justice in the courtroom, his tireless dedication to teaching all of us to be better lawyers, his leadership, his example, and his voice. Would you please join me in giving Albert Krieger the Stephen Goldstein Award.
thank you seems so insignificant. Yeah. It does not begin to illustrate for you the feelings that I have and that I have had since I was told by Brian that I was to receive this award. Perhaps I should follow the pattern of the speakers before me, save for the flag and the jockey shorts, <laughs> <laughs> and thank people. And I want to beg your indulgence for about a minute. I am privileged beyond measure to receive this award but I am also even more privileged in having the family that I do. Three-fifths of them are here. My wife could not be here because she had surgery on Wednesday. She's fine. My Two of my daughters, one of whom, as you know, a county court judge in Miami-Dade felt that it was more important to keep their mother locked in a bedroom because she wanted to be here and would have been here if not restrained. <laughs> she has been probably more responsible than anyone else whom I could mention, whom I could think of, for whatever I am as a criminal defense lawyer. Inspirational, critical. Oh, for well over 30 years, she's come to every trial and been an ongoing commentator with a thousand times more brains and perspicacity than any talking head on television. <laughs> the result is that I believe that I've been able to touch witnesses with sensitivity and issues with understandable intelligence that I would never have been able to do by myself. <coughs> I wish you were here. I miss I was afraid. Let me get into the, the matters about which I think I should talk about. I was afraid that Donnie was going to mention parts of my life that I'm trying to forget. <laughs> and I've been trying to forget. I, <laughs> I don't meet strangers. For instance, if we go on a cruise and say, hi there, I represent John Gotti. That's it. How is your family? <laughs> the very mention of the name brings to my recall one incident in the trial, which if I live to be a thousand, I will never forget. We had spent three weeks selecting a jury, which was a lesson in interrogation techniques and the use of terror that they haven't thought of yet in Abu Ghraib. Let me tell you, no way, no way. People, would, poor jurors, one at a time, would come in through the door and they'd meet Gotti's eyes head on. They'd start to shake. <laughs> They would sit down and then be subject to an inquisition by a judge who really regretted being where he was. <laughs> well, three weeks was spent like that. And comes a Monday, we are supposed to go to trial. <coughs> On Sunday afternoon, <coughs> we get a phone call from the judge, come down to the courthouse. Go to the courthouse, 
The reason we had to go to the courthouse was that the government, with all due respect to any former U assistant U.S. attorneys or U.S. attorneys present, the government was going through its usual weeping, wailing, and whining. You know, <laughs> <laughs> the three W attack. And what was troubling them was that John Gotti was going to be in the courtroom. So they had tried to sell the judge a way of setting up the courtroom where Gotti would be out of the courtroom. <laughs> judge thought there was something wrong with that. <laughs> and I did too, come to think of it. So we spent about an hour moving furniture around in the dark courtroom, trying to get the government to sit down, shut up, and get ahead with the trial one way or the other. Finally, the judge lost his patience, and he said, this is my courtroom, this is the way I always have it set up, this is the way it will be set up, good night. Well, we ran out of the courtroom. The following morning, it's the day, and this case had received, for reasons that really escaped me, international attention. So the judge had made arrangements that, <coughs> facing the bench, the right side of the courtroom, which we called the bright side, for some reason, the right side of the courtroom was devoted to the media. And this was a relatively large courtroom. I would say it sat close to 200 people. So you have the media over on the bride side. On the groom side, well, you have to have one empty row for security, correct? We all know about that. You need security. The next row consisted of your honor. It's only right that those who have an interest in the defendant having known the defendant, having perhaps become relations of his, should have a place to sit in the courtroom and as close to where things are taking place as they can. So the judge gave us two rows. And we had the next two rows. Behind them, for a row and a half, were assistant U.S. attorneys. Behind, in the next half, three quarters of a row were miscellaneous agents and so forth until we finally get to the public having one and a half rows in the back. Courtroom, where the, the marshals got order, was downstairs there was a bakery wheel. And when people would come into the courthouse, they would take a number. And then they'd line up like they were going to Radio City Music Hall <laughs> in order to get a seat to listen to really some awfully boring testimony when all was said and done. So, you know, who's interested? Who, who wants to hear? You know why I had to kill Jelly Belly? <laughs> That's thrilling. <laughs> so, there we are. Courtroom is full, it's bristling. The night before we found out, Andy Maloney, who was the U.S. attorney, and really is a great guy, was nervous about his opening statement. So he rehearsed his opening statement in the courtroom to an empty jury box. <laughs> hey, it's good to be prepared, right? He wanted to have his wife, his mother, and two of his daughters attend to see this moment, which was going to be reported internationally. The U.S. attorney is laying out his case against this crime figure. Only problem was that, as I've indicated, that, court, that courtroom was full when suddenly a marshal comes in and we over here say, Andy, your family's here. There's not a seat in the courtroom. Not a seat. To set the stage up here instead of that thing over there, the two-headed baby. <laughs> instead of that, there was 
a demonstrative that was probably 10 feet by 15 feet, consisting of bust shots of the 21 captains in the Gambino family and the hierarchy. Gotti on top, Siglieri, the underboss, and the captains. These pictures were there, and they were up there because the government was going to use that as evidence. They had a right to have it up there, and wanted to point it out in the opening. The family comes in, they can't find a place. The first two rows, as I indicated, are taken by Gotti people. If you look closely, 20 of the 21 in the picture was sitting there. <laughs> so, <laughs> Mrs. Maloney and Mrs. Maloney and the two daughters are standing at the swing doors to the well. They look at Andy, where are they going to go? We don't have a seat. Seated on the far end is Frankie DeChico, who straightens out his nose a little bit. Hey, we'll make room. <laughs> and Whammo moves over 10 torpedoes, and there suddenly gets to be enough room and the Maloney's sit down with the Gotti's <laughs> I'm looking at this, and I really don't believe what is going on, but little do I know what is going to happen. The judge says, bring the defendants out. They're both in the bullpen. The bullpen is over there. Jury box is over there, and here's the, here are the spectators. Finally, the moment the press has been thirsting for arrives. Gotti is going to make his appearance. Gotti making his appearance. Dressed in about $5,000 worth of clothes, you know. Comes out there, he looks. The two rows rise. The king has come out. The Gambin, the, the Maloney's don't know any better. They rise. has caused, as I feel it, from my children and my wife. And to see that if it weren't for Irene's illness, everybody would have been here to participate in the joy that I feel today is almost payment by itself. But you know, I'm a lawyer. I'm a criminal defense lawyer. I made my choice. I think of myself in terms of what am I supposed to do as a criminal defense lawyer? And I tell you something. I heard part of the seminar this morning. and. 
what impressed me most was the cataloging of the perils which confront us from things such as the Patriot Act, from what President Bush has set loose in the world, from John Ashcroft's warped idea of justice. And I say something must be wrong with how I approach life because that does not depress me. If that does anything to me as such, and it does do something to me, it spreads out a challenge for me. And perhaps challenge may not be the right word. I am, and I believe it with religious fervor, a devotee of individual rights. I believe in the Ninth Amendment. I disagree with Judge Bork when during the time of his testimony before the Senate Committee, his confirmation hearings, he said the Ninth Amendment was a dead letter. I believe that all rights are inherent in the people and that rights which have not been detailed, be it in the Constitution or otherwise, remain resident in the people. Whether those rights relate to what a woman does with her body or how we try a death case, they remain part of the soul of the individual. Well, it is one thing, is it not, for us to catalog rights wherever they may be enshrined. And merely cataloging rights does not address that which we as criminal defense lawyers should be doing. Our task, our commitment, is that we will take a right from paper or parchment, vindicate it, make it come alive, make it be the very breath and spirit of our country. And if we do that, we are fulfilling a lot of what this award stands for. It is most important, I believe, that as criminal defense lawyers, every case that we try is an education to the jury, to the spectators, to the judge, to the prosecutor, of what our system of justice is and what our system of justice should be and that we recognize and realize that rights, particularly individual rights, must be fought for continually and repeatedly. Nobody gives you anything for free. If you want to sit back and say, well, Mr. Padilla can rot in jail, he's nothing but a lousy terrorist, you're giving up something of yourself. You're also forgetting, probably, what John Adams thought, what James Madison thought, what Thomas Jefferson thought. They didn't think that that which was enshrined in the Constitution was going to be a forgotten word. They knew that in order for, Consti for the Constitution to live, it must be rejuvenated continually. And it is only rejuvenated by you and you and you and me. The criminal defense lawyer, we are the ones who bring the issues before the public. We are the ones who demand from the courts 
the announcements and pronouncements of true justice and true individual right in how we try our cases and what issues we present and bring forward to the courts. Oh sure, things are going to be perhaps two steps forward and one step back. There are going to be struggles along the way. Whoever thought that in their lifetime they're going to see actions by the United States government such as putting a person in jail, incommunicado, and interrogating that person for a year and a half. That can't happen in the United States, but it has happened. That issue goes before the Supreme Court. And it's always dangerous to predict what the Supreme Court is liable to do, regardless of what we may expect. But who would ever imagine that the Associate Attorney General, the second highest attorney in the United States government, would go on television and, in effect, backdoor the Supreme Court, present to the Supreme Court the litany of horrors connected with the Padilla case in order to assure itself, because I'm sure that was the thinking, of a decision from the Supreme Court whereby in this election year, George Bush can say, you see, I was right. Without confrontation, without trial testing, without litigation testing. Well, if we lose that one, we lose that one just gives us something else to fight for further down the road. But I'll be damned if I'll sit around and cry. I'll be damned if I'll accept it. Maybe it's because I come from the generation of Jews that went quietly into the gas chamber. But just as they said in Israel, never again. I fought in courts across this country, never again. I don't go quietly into the night. And I will do whatever is necessary to bring the Constitution back to its magnificent peaks that have made the United States the country that it should be and seems to be avoiding in these days. If you walk away from your obligation, then you truly have not lived up to the oath which we have heard today in various forms. <laughs> Even with music. The <laughs> we have a difficult task. And the fact that things as they are going on now are making it more difficult should be nothing else than inspirations to us to be more proficient in what we do. I may have mentioned this in part. I don't feel that I have walked away from a trial as a complete loser. And I've tried some cases, let me tell you, if my mother were on the jury, it wouldn't help. <laughs> <laughs> I don't walk away a loser if I can feel that there are 12 jurors who are going to go out as missionaries and spread the word of justice and what justice means, and how it should be administered. I think that was Stephen Goldstein's message. I believe it was. 
and I think I'm true to his memory if I live out my days doing that. Thank you very much. There's nothing else to be said. This is the uh, this uh, annual meeting of the FACDL for. I know you all are proud of Albert. I just want to tell you, I thank you all as a family for what he's done for all of us. You're really great. It's a wonderful family. and uh, figure it out and hopefully it all came out. <laughs> yeah, it's a camera.